Okay. So we start our last session from the morning. Uh, who is going to be given by Alejandro Adam. He is the director of MyTax in Canada and former director of the UMI in Vancouver. He will speak on a taste of groups, topology, and representation theory. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I, it's a pleasure to be here as a uh, student, former student from UNAM, a former UMI uh, director, and uh, just a person who likes international collaborations. I also uh, owe a lot to Lefschetz. Let's not forget that this new UMI is named after Lefschetz. Lefschetz played a historic role in uh, Mexican mathematics. Uh, creating a lot of activity, uh, especially in uh, algebraic topology, a very strong uh, school in algebraic topology in Mexico, and later on uh, also in dynamical systems. And he even uh, sent people uh, to get degrees in applied mathematics. So uh, the, the uh, influence of Solomon Lefschetz on Mexican mathematics is really extraordinary. And it's, uh, I think, very uh, a fitting tribute that his name be assigned to this new UME. Okay, so I'm going to ha give you a kind of a leisurely introduction to some topics. I was told by Pepe to give you a taste of what groups, uh, you know, of a certain topic I might be interested in. And towards the end, there'll be some more hardcore things, but you know, we'll see. Okay, so we'll start out in a very elementary way. All right. First of all, Okay, so uh, we do away, you know, we're not into geometric, uh, very rigid geometric structures or even rigid algebraic structures. We're thinking of this as topologists. So, uh, but we do want to consider nice topological spaces. So certainly compact manifolds fit in that. Uh, more generally, you think about spaces built out of uh, cells, so-called CW complexes. And uh, one of the things you learn in mathematics is that to understand a space X, you have to study its group of symmetries. And a lot of what we saw today was, of course, uh, the, in the disguised versions of that uh, kind of problem. Now, we, we think of a group as realized as a group of symmetries for X if uh, there's a group homomorphism from G to the homeomorphisms of X. And here, of course, I'm talking in the topological category. You could look at diffeomorphisms, Symplectomorphisms, uh, could, you have uh, more algebraic things. Now the term on the left here denotes the group of homeomorphisms from X to X. And in this case, we would say that the group G acts on the topological space X. Now that's a, a very basic fact. Now once you have a group action, what uh, kind of invariance do you worry about for your group action? So what is it that you need to understand? Well, the isotropy. So given a point in the space, you want to understand what are the elements in the group which fix that point. So that's, you know, from the elements in the, in the space, you obtain groups, subgroups. So this is a way of going from the topological stuff to the group theoretic stuff. Now, conversely, if I have a H, a subgroup of G, we define its fixed point set as the points in X which are fixed. they are all the elements of H. And uh, you obtain uh, fixed point sets under H. So that is giving you a way of going from subgroups of G to subspaces of X. And you have uh, the relation that if H is containing K, then the K fixed points are contained in the H fixed points of X. So all the information of the, about the isotropy, all the information about the fixed point sets, these are all required to understand uh, the equivariant structure of a topological space. And there's some well-known techniques in algebraic topology that make this evident. There are things like the equivariant Whitehead theorem, you know, that's that, which tell you that you really have to understand uh, this full, uh, full structure. So, uh, however, um, there's, a, there's a certain kind of actions where you basically do away with the uh, isotropy questions. That's the so-called free action. So those are actions where the isotropy is trivial for all points at x. Or equivalently, if the fixed point sets are uh, empty for all non-trivial subgroups in H in G. So, um, and the most uh, basic example that people 
think about is that of covering spaces. And it's okay to think of this as finite covering spaces because we're talking about nice spaces here, okay? We want everything here to be nice. Well, at least for now. Uh, and here you have a covering space of this graph. There's a, the, and the quotient here is this graph over here. So there's some very beautiful examples that you can draw in the case of graphs. So, uh, so now you can start playing with this. And um, a key thing which you learn in your topology course in the case of a finite sheeted cover, we have a finite automorphism group G acting freely on the covering space. Okay. And every point X has a neighborhood U which is permuted by the action uh, of G. So that's the picture we had over here. Can we go back? No, you can't. Oh. oh, sorry about that. Here, you have these inverse images. These are moved around and they're all disjoint, right? And they all cover this uh, basic elementary neighborhood downstairs. Okay, so now we define the quotient space for the action as follows. So we say that two points are uh, equivalent if there is a G which takes one to the other. So this is a nice equivalence relationship and um, there are two points are equivalent if they're in the same orbit. So it's a very standard thing. And now you can take the space of orbits. So what I do then is given a point Point here in M, you map it to the equivalence class of its orbit. So um, if we're talking about free actions, then this is a nice covering space. And if this is a manifold, then this will also be a manifold. However, in the case that we're seeing before, if it's not a free action, then you get an orbit fold. And the, the question that was raised last time, well, uh, do those singular uh, spaces have the structure of an orbit fold? And one of the, the beautiful formulas you have here for order characteristics is that the order characteristic of M is the order of the group times the order characteristic of the quotient space. And this is very easy to verify just because you look at inverse images of the cells here, they give you as many uh, cells here as the order of the group. And there's a, by taking a sufficiently fine subdivision, you can prove that. So that's a, that's a very, very nice formula that you can uh, play around with. I have some pictures here, but okay. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example for you. A surface of genus four and a free Z3 action. You're rotating here. You have an axis here which you can rotate on. And in that example, the order characteristic is equal to minus six because it's a surface of genus four and it's two minus two G is the, the order characteristic. So it's minus six. So if you divide out by the Z3 symmetry, you obtain a surface of order characteristic equal to minus two, which looks like this. So those are very beautiful, very simple examples which you get from Riemann surfaces. Now, a, a general problem you can pose here, given a compact manifold M, describe all finite groups that act freely on it. Problem for you, go and do as homework. Uh, <laughs> and we say, uh, and we always like to say there are always situations you can you can do uh, the n-dimensional disk. Yes, if you have uh, an action, uh, uh, any map from the n-dimensional disk to itself will have a fixed point, and hence there's no non-trivial finite group acting freely on M. So that's a, a very simple example, and of course, um, up to deformation, of course, you can you can extend this. Now. Uh, here's the uh, basic example. Suppose you have M, the surface of genus three. Which finite groups G can act freely, preserving orientation on M? And this is a condition just to make it easier exposition. So that would be the condition that M mod G does not contain a Mobius band. Well, now you, here you have the order characteristic of M is equal to minus four. And given that the order characteristic of the quotient must be even, we see that the only possibility is for the order of the group to be equal to two, G equal to Z mod two, and M mod G is a surface of genus two. That's the, so it's very, very rigid, very beautiful. And the key thing here is that we have an order characteristic which is positive, and we'll get to that. So now what about an even dimensional sphere? We had to mention Lefschetz here. If you have a map, uh, two maps from the even dimensional sphere to itself, uh, if they do not have fixed points, then their composition has a fixed point. And that's just a question of degree because uh, uh, if minus one times minus one is equal to one. Uh, now, if G acts freely on such an M by the above 
we have that the, comp the, the uh, product of any two elements in G must be equal to one. Therefore, the group is either trivial or Z mod two. This, of course, does occur at the antipodal map. So anyway, all those examples I gave you, which we considered, uh, someone was saying, what does trivial mean? Something I can figure out in seven minutes, what was it? <laughs> Our basic examples, let's say. Okay, so now uh, the question is, well, what about finite group actions on an odd dimensional sphere? where the order characteristic is zero, and this simple scheme kind of breaks down. So then you get to the uh, Smith theory, uh, and the group cohomology plays a role here, as, as there's uh, some questions about um, spherical space forms. So let's take a leisurely stroll through this. Basic theorem, if a finite group G acts freely on a sphere, then all of its abelian subgroups are cyclic. That's the fundamental, one of the fundamental theorems of Smith theory from around 1940. Now what this means is that if G, G does not contain any subgroup of the form Z, Z mod P cross Z mod P, or should I say Z mod P cross Z mod P, for P a prime, the so-called P squared condition. That's, it's a very beautiful fact which can be proved basically using uh, cohomology, cohomological methods. And here are examples. Uh, uh, you can show that the uh, Every cyclic group acts freely on an odd-dimensional sphere, just as, in fact, every circle does, so it's a subgroup. The quaternion group of order eight is a subgroup of S3, so it acts freely on it. In fact, all those examples that Christoph is talking about, every finite subgroup of SU2 acts freely on a three-dimensional sphere. So these are quite familiar to uh, topologists uh, who do this kind of thing. Okay. Now, there's a very beautiful theorem due to Milner which introduced uh, uh, more geometry. What he says is that a finite group, G, acting freely on a sphere must have every element of order two in its center. So that means that every, every element of order two in the group has to commute with every other element in the finite group. So that's a very interesting um, restriction that arises from uh, the geometric setting. And here we have the, the example, which at the time was kind of interesting, the dihedral group of order 2p cannot act freely on any sphere because there's an element of order p, and the element of order 2, what it does is that it conjugates the, the element the generator to its uh, negative. So that group cannot act freely on any sphere. And that's what's called the 2p condition. Now, uh, what we're going to do is uh, start to think about uh, actions in a less rigid way. We're going to start to think about actions up to homotopy, and the so-called theory of actions up to homotopy. And the first instance of that really was the theorem of Swan from 1960. What he showed is that a G, a group G, will act freely on a finite complex homotopy equivalent to a sphere for if and only if every abelian subgroup in G is cyclic. So what, what Swan showed is that um, Smith's condition is necessary and sufficient for uh, an action on a finite complex homotopy equivalent to a sphere. So here we have a notion of taking a complex and deforming it, and if you do the right deformation, you can have then a free action. So really, really, uh, we start to see a separation between uh, geometric actions and actions up to homotopy, and the beginnings of a kind of a, an algorithm where you say, well, first I'll construct an action up to homotopy, so within a homotopy type, then I'll figure out whether I can find a manifold, uh, uh, a version of that, and there's a, a, a whole theory of obstructions associated to that, which is known as the surgery theory. And then you can produce actions on actual uh, manifolds. So, uh, so we see, for example, that the, the group of order 2p will act freely on any homotopy, on a homotopy sphere. And I'm not saying which one, I'm saying one which you can construct uh, abstractly. And now the, the, uh, the big result in the, in the theory of actions on spheres of free actions with the, the solution of the spherical space form problem by Madsen, Thomas, and Wall, 76. A finite group G acts freely on some sphere if and only if G has cyclic abelian subgroups and every evolution is central. So, uh, and that of course is very satisfactory because it's, a, it's an actual action on the sphere. It's actually, you can get these to be smooth actions. So it's all quite beautiful. And I'm not saying anything here about the obstructions of doing that. It's a whole big subject called uh, surgery theory, which appears there. So now uh, what we want to do here is maybe think about this from a more modern perspective. So instead of considering group actions, we want to look at homotopy 
group actions. So uh, this is kind of joint work with, uh, by myself and Jesper Grono. Uh, so what are we going to do here? So, so what does it mean then to act on a, on a space, right? So before we had talked about actions where the, um, th the way you acted was through uh, homeomorphisms of the space to itself. But now, instead of homeomorphisms, we just want to act by homotopy equivalents. So you want to be able to go from a space to itself uh, with a map which, is, which will have a homotopy inverse. So it's invertible up to homotopy. So this is a, a very, um, you know, it, it allows you, you know, one, of the, one of the important things about algebraic topology at the time was that it allowed you to go from the rigidity of homeomorphisms to homotopy, homotopy equivalence, and homotopy deformation to construct homotopy invariant um, object. So if you can show that a theory was invariant under homotopy, then you can show that it's very robust and would allow you to, uh, to uh, give you some interesting information. So now, uh, you would like naively to say, let's take a map from G to out of X and try to construct that. Now, there was an attempt to do that in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I guess it was George Cook and some other people. It becomes very messy and it's not, um, not something that works very well. So um, what we propose here is a derived way of doing that. So instead of looking at the, at the groups, uh, the monoid, let's look at the classifying spaces. So uh, briefly, what is a classifying space? Well, uh, its classifying space is a complex admitting a principal G bundle over over it, such that the total space is contractible. So this has, G has a, a free G action. This is a principal G bundle. And this space over here happens to have contra be contractible. That means that it has a homotopy type of a point. And one of the, the, uh, the nice results is that uh, any principal G bundle over a nice space X can be pulled back, pulled back from the universal bundle. So is the picture we have of uh, if you have a space M and you want to consider principal bundles over M, principal G bundles, we have this so-called universal principal G bundle due to Milner, and you can pull it back like this, and you'll get this principal G bundle, which is the pullback of this one here. So in fact, you're classifying principal G bundles using these maps down here. That's a very beautiful result due to Steenrod. So, uh, now, uh, so classifying spaces classify bundles. Uh, also, if the group is discrete, then the, the BG is, in fact, an example of an eilenberg maclean space of type uh, G1. So it's a KG1 for G discrete, when G is discrete. And that's a space all of whose homotopy is concentrated in degree 1, and it's precisely just the fundamental group, which is G itself. So, okay, so now what we're going to consider are homotopy classes of maps from BG into B out X. And the philosophy of this is that, you know, just as when people study things like GLN Z, very, very complicated group, and you want to consider finite subgroups of GLN Z, there are people who study the finite subgroups of GLN Z, how these things work. If, if I want to understand out X, I'm going to put a B here, and I'm going to be studying maps from BG. So this is going to be a way of understanding how, how, these, uh, how these things uh, sit in there and, and interact. So uh, that's what we're going to call uh, homotopy group actions. So a homotopy group action is simply going to be a homotopy class of maps from BG to B out X. OK. So, so uh, cohomology plays a big role here. I'll try to say not much about cohomology, but you know, it's, we're all more than halfway through the talk, right? So, they say, in the good talk, your, your grandmother should understand the first five minutes, probably. And you yourself should not understand the last five minutes. <laughs> so we're, we're getting there. So, so associated to a homotopy group action, you have a fiber homotopy equivalence class of vibrations. So in fact, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, uh, homotopy group actions 
and these homotopy equivalence classes of vibrations. And that is realizing the action up to homotopy. So what did you do? What is it that we want to do here? Let's take X to be a nice compact space, a finite complex, and that'll be our sort of fixed homotopy type that we're looking at. And then we're going to be looking at uh, homotopy group actions on that. So maps from BG into BLX. And that is then equivalent to considering these equivalence classes of vibrations. And this space is the homotopy orbit space of this, of this action and is an invariant of the homotopy action. So whatever you do, you know, given our homotopy class, this is going to be an invariant and therefore it's up to homotopy and therefore it's cohomology is going to be an invariant. So um, now we can also, and I won't give you any details, but there's a representation, mg of x, which can be defined using the homology of the universal cover. And we obtain here a very, uh, very uh, nice theorem, which tells you the following. Given a homotopy G action on X, then the cohomology of this, of this invariant, the cohomology of this homotopy orbit space, is finitely generated as an abelian group, if and only if this module is a projective module, in which case G acts freely on a finite dimensional complex Y homotopy equivalent to X, Moreover, if the module is stably free, then GX free on a finite complex homotopy equivalent to X. Um, let me uh, unpack that a little bit. So now, see, so you have your homotopy type and you have a homotopy action. And you want to ask whether in that equivalence class you can get an action on a finite complex. Okay, is there, is there a, an action on an actual, actual action, a geometric action on a finite complex, which is in that equivalence class? And it turns out that it is true if and only if this cohomological invariant is a finitely generated abelian group. And now that is equivalent to having this module be projective, projective as a, as a representation. Now that's a, a beautiful theorem due to Wall, the classical theorem of when, uh, of kind of uh, addressing the situation, when you have a, a, a complex which is finite, dimensional, in terms of cohomological invariance, right? Taking cohomology with coefficients. And uh, you have a projective module, and uh, so that's finite dimensionality. And now to get an actual finite complex, uh, there's something called the finiteness obstruction, and that is measured here. This is a projective module, but if it is stably free, meaning that if I can add a finitely generated uh, free module to get a free module, then I can always do a finite complex. That's a, a, an algebraic condition. And what I'm hiding here is that really it's an element in K naught here, right? And you want that to vanish in there, right? So there's some K theory here, which we're not. We're trying to explain it very uh, simply. So these are what you call homotopy free group actions. So in fact, uh, we can show that a homotopy action of, of G on X is free if and only if it is homotopically free for every subloop of prime order. So that's a, that's a, that's a nice result because it, um, you know, when you look at an action, uh, an, uh, on this geometric action is free if and only if every uh, subgroup of order P acts freely on the space. And you get the same thing up to homotopy, but what you need to do here is instead of using uh, fixed points, you use homotopy fixed points. And that is the, look at the maps from this contractible G space G into Y, the G equivariant maps, and those are the so-called homotopy fixed points. So, um, Anyway, that's an invariant of a homotopy action. <coughs> now, uh, we'll say, let me introduce here the notion of periodicity because it's a very important one in this game. And um, if you don't know cohomology, well, my apologies, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, the notion, uh, cohomology is an algebraic invariant of a topological space. And uh, it's a, like a, a potentially an infinite number of abelian groups, but under some favorable conditions, they start repeating themselves in a pattern. And that's a, a very beautiful situation which occurs uh, in, 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 uh, in topology. And the, the, the most um, striking examples appear in the cohomology of, of finite groups. For example, if you take the cohomology of a cyclic groups here, Let's take the reduced cohomology. For example. And if you take the quaternion group, 
which is one of Christoph's favorite groups, now I know, compute this cohomology. This is going to be isomorphic to And zero uh, odd. See, so it it uh, it, it uh, repeats. It has a fourfold periodicity. So this this cohomology has fourfold periodicity, and that in fact corresponds to the fact uh, that it's acting freely on a three-dimensional sphere. So um, anyway, this is the notion of, com of a cohomology of a space having uh, being periodic. We say it is periodic if there are integers r s greater than zero and a class alpha such that for any coefficient module m, cup product with this alpha induces an isomorphism in all sufficiently high degrees. And the basic example is from Martin and Tate. For a finite group G, the space BG has periodic cohomology if and only if every abelian subgroup in G is cyclic. So that ties in uh, the Smith th theorem with group cohomology. So then what people saw is that the notion of, uh, of groups acting freely on spheres was tied in directly with the notion of periodicity in group cohomology. Now this notion here is true for any, any topological space. In fact, this definition is due to myself and uh, Jeff Smith, I, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, and then we get uh, uh, an interpretation of uh, uh, one of my theorems with uh, Jeff Smith, which says the following. Given a G homotopy action on a simply connected finite complex X, then the homotopy orbit space has periodic cohomology if and only if this module admit, admits a periodic projective resolution. And in this case, G acts freely on a finite complex Y homotopy equivalent to a product where now you have a sphere cross X for some N greater than zero. So um, this is the case of what we call homotopy periodic actions. So that environment we have, if it has periodic cohomology, then what that tells you is that the group will act freely, not on the space itself, but on the space cross some sphere. So you can take care of the, uh, the, the, uh, of the action, but you have to cross with a sphere. Now, if you take the case of a point, then that tells you that if a, a finite group has periodic cohomology, that then it'll act freely on a sphere. So this is a, a Swan's theorem is the case at x equal to a point of this result over here. And, uh, so these are what we call homotopy periodic actions. And um, the corollary here, if there is a homotopy periodic action of G on a sphere, then the group acts freely on a finite complex X, homotopy equivalent to a product of two spheres. So it's a, it's a very nice result that homotopy periodic actions give rise to actions on a product of two spheres. And, and I should say it's an open problem to understand what are the finite groups that act freely on a product of two spheres. So it gets quite complicated, and uh, I guess uh, I'm almost out of time. So um, it's not hard to see that the groups acting homotopy periodically on a sphere must have rank at most two. And the pro basic problem here is determine all finite groups G that act homotopy periodically on some sphere. And uh, the theorem here is the following. Well, first of all, a bad group. So um, you take a semi-direct product. You take SL2Z with the, with the natural action on ZP cross ZP. You take the semi-direct product for P and R prime. Then this group cannot act homotopy periodically on any sphere. So that was the, the first kind of obstruction that, uh, that, that arose in the initial experiments. And now we have a theorem uh, which says a rank 2 finite group G acts homotopy periodically on some sphere if and only if it does not P prime involve the groups QDP for any pr odd prime. So that is telling you that in terms of the group structure up to, a prime, away from, uh, up to primes away from P, that that is the only problem that you have in terms of constructing a uh, homotopy action. So, uh, so now the, the problem which follows from here is to try to construct some exotic actions using the methods of homotopy group actions. And uh, what we have, and this is a technical thing, but if you have a map, all you need is a map like this, but now in algebraic topology, we know how to decompose this P locally. We have something called P pseudo subgroups. So then you can, you, and there's a ways of, of, of doing P completions in there. So then you have something like an arithmetic square, 
where you can do things one prime at a time and then glue them together. So you have a, a little factory for constructing actions uh, by gluing things at different primes. So you can construct some exotic actions that are very difficult to find in nature. And um, anyway, uh, well, this is just meant to be a taste. Uh, of course, the taste, maybe the first taste was uh, sweet and pleasant. <laughs> and towards the end, uh, it's harder to swallow. But that's the reality. Thank you very much. Any question or comment? Yes. Yeah, the example that you had on your slide of uh, Hartman Tate uh, is actually uh, very important in the cohomological proof of uh, Hartman reciprocity in mm. class field theory. Oh, okay. And so I'm wondering if there's any uh, meaningful reformulation of uh, class field theory using the homotopy uh, actions. Um, okay, uh, I guess I, 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 haven't, I haven't thought about that, uh, but that's a, a, good, uh, a good tip. Yeah, I have to think about that. Yeah. Someone else? I would say that uh, you know, the rank, higher rank groups, how they, what role they play in number theory, right? With these uh, um, cohomological invariants, I don't think that has been uh, exploited so well, much. I mean, first of all, you're talking about dealing with yeah. Oh, there are always abelian groups. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. It's, uh, class field theory concerns Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I would say that for us as topologists, the basic problem is if you have a space whose cohomology is sort of polynomial on k variables, there should be a vibration uh, where the fiber is like looks like a sphere, a product of spheres of k uh, of of k spheres. Uh, right, and the, here you have polynomial, and there should be a vibration like that, and those guys should be transgressing in some appropriate way to take care of it. Anyway, that's the philosophy. Okay, well, thank you again. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, this restriction to finite groups is uh, part of your taste. Is that correct? You oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you never mentioned uh, other cases which are presumably also very interesting, right? Oh, of course, yeah. And in fact, if I go back to this, uh, this uh, theorem here, uh, you can consider the situation of a discrete group, right? And there's a, there's a theorem that says if you have a, a discrete group of finite uh, VCD uh, which has uh, periodic cohomology, then it acts freely on a sphere cross Euclidean space. So we can, we can prove that. It was a conjecture made by Wall. So yet, indeed, you can take uh, uh, discrete groups and, and plug them in here, and it tells you things about those homotopy group actions. Yeah, so this is just to keep it simple. I just did the finite groups. And the representation theory, of course, is a lot easier, too. So of course, yeah, we take B gamma, if you want, into B out x. What is strange to me, at least, that you never mention Lie groups and why they appear, why they uh, in distribution of many physical symmetries. And, Oh, okay. You don't need them. I, well, I would say uh, I'm hiding them, right? Because I'm, yeah, I'm exactly. being a Bourbakiist, exactly. right? I'm exactly. But the, uh, many of the examples come from the finite subgroups of Lie groups, right? And uh, because there are natural actions which are sitting in there. And, it, and in fact, we're able to realize examples from this theorem using uh, uh, finite subgroups of unitary groups and then uh, the associated Stiefel manifolds which come out of that. Uh, yes, that's, that's a very good point. Okay, well, thank you, Doc.